kind of ashamed and profoundly disappointed, not just on this issue, but on several issues, as to how universities manage to ignore deeply important questions. And after 40 years in the institution, you get to see what those are. Now, 9-11 is really uh, one of the most dramatic cases I've ever seen of this. Now, my friend Peter Dale Scott talks about deep events. He talks about events which we don't spend too much time trying to understand, that we, in a sense, try not to understand. Events which, we, which make a huge impact on the way we live, but we stop uh, thinking about them almost as soon as they happen. Universities, they are recognized for their research powerhouses, their education, their student life, and their tradition of open discourse on campus. But are there certain lines of inquiry that are considered taboo within universities? Immediately following the tragic events of September 11th, 2001, the academic community quickly adopted the official story of that fateful day, as described by the Bush administration, that a group of Arab hijackers led by Osama bin Laden managed to hit precious landmarks without any interference because of intelligence failures on that day. The 9-11 Commission, whose mandate was to provide the fullest possible account of the events of September 11th, also restated this conclusion in their 571-page commission report. Throughout the years, government officials and the media further reinforced this story, which has served as the foundation of the war on terror. Academia at large has also maintained this version of events in their curriculum and publications. But have universities critically examined the official story? Is it taboo to do so? Why do several academics identify themselves with this story when they are harsh critics of the U.S. administration's war on terror? These questions are of crucial importance to a growing number within the academic community. Here's a transformative event which involves so-called global war on terror, increase in military budgets, a reformulated foreign policy, restrictions of civil rights. So massively important and a watershed event and What's the university doing? You know, writing some ethereal postmodern critiques of it, but are they asking the basic question, what happened on that day? Who did it? You're not supposed to ask that. I think it's uh, just considered, oh, we're not going there. It's just not, it's a subject to be avoided, but not, and if you ask people, no, there's no taboo about it. It's just that it's not my area, or uh, it's all too confusing, or, who needs it? There's so many other areas that we can uh, critique the uh, establishment on. It's interesting to, that in the academy, the case of the invasion of Iraq has received a considerable amount of attention. And that has exposed uh, a considerable number of serious crimes. And yet, 9-11 doesn't get the same treatment. 9-11 is still considered uh, out of bounds. I think one of the ways to register the fact that 9-11 is, is something of a taboo subject in the academy is to look at the uh, scholarship that actually has been published about 9-11. Uh, there's been very little examination of the, the evidence, examination of the 9-11 Commission report. They have all kinds of stories that they'll embellish the story with, uh, the official story, but they won't criticize it. That tends to be a general path within academia, even among left-wingers, uh, even among very people you would expect to be critical about government stories. This is one government story that's untouchable. Um, often, and now I'm speaking specifically of the humanities, um, often publications that are about 9-11 in some particular way, um, they, 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 they work from a presumption, they work from an idea of 9-11 rather than uh, a specific set of, of evidence. 
and they certainly don't interrogate uh, those presumptions very much. The response of many progressive thinkers is best exemplified by Noam Chomsky in his book 9-11, an international bestseller. In a paragraph, Chomsky states, Evidence about the perpetrators of 9-11 has been hard to find, and long after the source of the anthrax attack was localized to U.S. government weapons laboratories, it has still not been identified. Nevertheless, despite the thin evidence, the initial conclusion about 9-11 is presumably correct. Academia is by its nature very, very uh, focused, very specialized, and right away you have, therefore, uh, sort of blind spots that make it uh, difficult for ac academics to go beyond a certain area. There's also this notion of society as being very structured and as being created out of structures in which individual action did not have much impact. So for a lot of even Marxist academics or leftist academics, uh, even for them who you expect to be critical of a, a government story, uh, they're more interested in the broad, broader s structural aspects of society. They don't want to look at this thing called September 11th, uh, except obviously in terms of how it's, how it's affected society since, but they're not interested in the event itself. There are a number of, of recent books in cultural studies, for example, looking at 9-11 uh, in film, in television. Um, these books, you would think, would have to establish some kind of uh, explicit narrative. So when we're talking about 9-11 in film, uh, wh exactly what are we talking about? But um, their, their treatment of the actual gaps in the story, of the ambiguities in the 9-11 Commission report, their treatment of uh, the demonstrable errors in the report or omissions um, is, is negligible. So they may spend a few pages in, in a two or three hundred page book uh, addressing 9-11 skepticism. Uh, and usually it is treated in a, in a kind of dismissive tone. Last year I went through, I decided to go through journals of history and I said okay let's narrow it down to journals of contemporary American history. Journals that ought to be dealing to some extent with global war and terror, 9-11 and so on. And I looked at every issue since September 11, 2001. I did not find a single article that raised the question, who did it? Or is the governmental narrative accurate? You know, they assumed it was accurate. They sometimes questioned what was done in response to it. You know, they were critical of that. There were lots of fancy postmodern, postcolonial articles that were very complicated and sophisticated. You know, reading 9-11 and interpreting 9-11 and 9-11 as narrative, 9-11 as script. But as far as I could tell, there wasn't a single one that actually said, what happened on that day? What kind of historian is that? What does that say about the discipline of history right now? None of the books I can think of make any reference to the many book-length studies of the evidence that have been done by people such as David Ray Griffin. Um, even if you don't agree with everything in, in Griffin's analysis, um, there are parts of it that are um, undeniably legitimate and, and deserve to be examined by scholars. So, so there's, there's clearly um, an, an intention there to simply avoid the discussion altogether. David Ray Griffin, a professor emeritus of the philosophy of religion at Claremont School of Theology, has offered over 30 books, a dozen of which are devoted to exposing contradictions, omissions, and distortions within the 9-11 official story. Despite endorsements from distinguished scholars and former CIA officers, his literature remains unexamined by the larger academic community. Uh, one possible explanation for this broader perception, I think, is, is what communication scholars call the spiral of silence theory. Um, the spiral of silence addresses the, 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 this basic question. 
Are we more willing to express our beliefs uh, when we perceive support for those beliefs and less willing to disclose them when we think they are not widely shared? So it's about your perception of public opinion and how that perception shapes your willingness to express certain ideas. So the uh, echo chamber of the corporate controlled media often gives the impression that certain ideas are more widely held than perhaps they are. If you look at the public opinion polls regarding 9-11, there was uh, a, a global opinion poll done that showed only 46% uh, of respondents believed Al-Qaeda were behind the 9-11 attacks. Um, <clears throat> so you, you might take from that that there's a great deal of uh, misinformation circulating. You, you, know, you might draw a number of conclusions from that, but at the very least, I think it demonstrates that there is a considerable amount of skepticism for whatever reason. So we can't simply proceed from the belief that the dominant opinion is, in, is entirely 100% congruent with the official 9-11 Commission report. And therefore, I think there's, at least in part because of that, uh, there, there is a legitimacy to exploring forms of 9-11 skepticism uh, academically. When it comes to Al-Qaeda and why most academics seem to accept uh, the, the official governmental narrative of bin Laden and Al-Qaeda and so on, um, you know, I'm going to be fairly blunt. But first, before I'm blunt, I want to say, look, university professors are very overworked these days. They tend to teach huge numbers of students. They have to publish. They have to do this and that. So many of the reasons why they, they haven't caught on are quite mundane. They're run off their feet. They're supposed to be specialists in there. They don't have time to just read around. Most of them have read almost nothing on 9-11 because they're too busy doing other things. So there's nothing very complicated there. It's not like they're doing something evil. It's like most people in society. They haven't taken the time or had the time to look into it. Having excused them a little bit in that way, I'm now going to be quite critical. I'm going to say that I think the main reasons they accept the official story are timidity and laziness. Timidity because, you know, it takes a certain um, intellectual courage to question a story that's being promoted so heavily by almost every government in the world and by the mainstream media and by most academics. The mainstream media, especially since 9-11, labeled skeptics of official stories as conspiracy theorists in the pejorative sense of the term. The larger academic community has also maintained this approach in its discourse and publications. And you'd think universities would be smart enough to see through um, vilification and thought stoppers like conspiracy theory. But for the most part, they don't. They don't. Conspiracies are people getting together to decide how to commit crimes or immoral acts. And moreover, 9-11 was obviously the result of a conspiracy. Somebody conspired. Maybe it was Al-Qaeda, maybe it was somebody else. So it's quite silly to dismiss this as a conspiracy theory. And yet, unreflectively, without thinking about it, they used this. And uh, I even think that the term conspiracy theory works especially well in universities, perhaps even better than outside universities. Because university people have a tendency, um, I'm afraid, towards arrogance. Uh, that, in other words, people outside the university believe all kind of nutty things. You know, they think Elvis is still alive or UFOs are here or whatever. But we in the university have critical thinking. So we're disciplined thinkers. We would never believe that. So we in the university know that history is a very messy thing. And, you know, I mean, it's not created by some cabal of people with handlebar mustaches. You know, with all kinds of uh, impersonal forces interacting with other forces and contingencies and accidents and the interaction of personality and institution. But there are the, in the great unwashed outside the university, some people who want to have a, a comforting, simplistic view of the universe think that history unfolds simply through bad people getting together in back rooms and planning it all. And that's, that's the conspiracy theorists. 
And we, therefore, are above that. And when we call someone a conspiracy theorist, we're not just calling them an idiot or a moron, though if we get really angry, we'll do that too. But we're implying that we're more intellectually sophisticated than there. And university people are very vulnerable to thought processes that allow them to feel a bit superior that way. Um, so my response took me a while to really understand the way to respond to this in order to make a, 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 an epistemological break with just this normalized unseeing and refusal to engage facts by saying, oh, you mean the official conspiracy theory? And that has worked very well in terms of then turning the table, so to speak, so it now becomes the onus is on the person who's brought up conspiracy theory to justify the most prominent conspiracy theory of all. Official conspiracy theories and false flag terrorism plans remain largely unexamined by universities. After nearly 40 years, Operation Northwoods was declassified. It called for shooting innocent people on American streets, hijacking planes, blowing up a U.S. ship, and with the support of clandestine media, the goal was to blame it on Cuba as a pretext for war. It was proposed and signed by every member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Perhaps the most recent case that the Academy has yet to connect the dots in relation to the events of 9-11 are the anthrax attacks. Although the Bush administration and the media quickly implicated Iraq, the alleged 9-11 hijackers, or Al-Qaeda in general, Investigations traced the anthrax to a U.S. bioweapons laboratory. Since blaming a Middle Eastern group had failed, the FBI then pointed their fingers at a domestic individual. However, Senator Patrick Leahy, who was giving indications of blocking the Patriot Act, became a target of the anthrax and was convinced many people were involved. I do not believe in any way, shape, or manner that he is the only person involved in this attack on Congress and the American people. I do not believe that at all. I believe there are others involved, either as accessories before or accessories after the fact. I believe there are others who can be charged with murder. Okay that somehow we're not going to look at that alternative story. We're, it's going to be forbidden. So here's where we get into taboo. It's forbidden. It is um, untouchable. It is unmentionable. It is dirty. It sullies you. It profanes you. It isolates you. All these things. What normally happens in order to discredit anything that discredits the official story is that they, the people who uh, raise the issue, are themselves attacked. The taboo against knowing the facts is here encoded into the identity structure itself. In the background, 9-11 justified any violation of international and constitutional law as essential to the war on terrorism. John McMurtry a professor of philosophy of international renown became one of the first academics to publicly question the official story of 9-11 and presented a paper entitled Why is there a war in Afghanistan? two months after 9-11 in which he asked the question who benefits from the attacks? Within the next two days the Wall Street Journal called him Osama McMurtry the Globe and Fox News followed quickly with ad hominem denunciation and his colleagues a couple of Harvard fame notified McMurtry that they are reporting him to the FBI and the CIA. Academics flooded his university with emails to its president and his department chair, demanding that McMurtry be fired. In the end, the university maintained McMurtry's professorship on grounds of academic freedom. Well, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you, you were able to get that established, that in fact he took an enormous amount of of, of, of uh, harassment as a result of, of statements he made. And that, of course, has the effect on all of his colleagues, has the effect on people who, who think that, they, that, that this is a subject which demands uh, some examination, and they, they begin to slide away because they, just, they, just, they see what has happened to him. Now, very likely, he's in Canada, not in the United States, 
or very possibly he would be in one of the uh, torture chambers of, uh, of, uh, of some Arab state. But I, I, I think that that's, that's exactly it. It's, it's a, in, fa in fact, the, the reaction is so, is so, is, is so um, overblown that you begin to realize that there must be something wrong here. As a philosopher, and epistemology being one of my areas, uh, just thinking, well, how does this happen? How do you get because there are people who run the official conspiracy theory and they not, are, are not part of uh, the Bush apparatus nor even in favor of the Bush apparatus. Why would it that they be identifying with this story? Uh, and indeed, often aggressively so. Because certainly, I don't, think, I don't think many of us would have trouble believing that a similar kind of episode took place in another country, uh, particularly you know, uh, a less developed country where we consider, but where we figure uh, things like that happen all the time and so forth. But we, we tend, in other words, to see our own government, our own society as very stable, uh, as very resistant to any kind of uh, interior corruption. And that's where a, a critique of 911 immediately takes you there. Well, I, I was president of the University of Ryerson. And when I was there, I had, a, I had a visit from the RCMP uh, who were asking me to co cooperate with them uh, in, in uh, identifying students who might be found to be um, security risks. Now, I ushered them out very quickly uh, and suggested to them that, that was not my responsibility and that they would not be receiving any reports from me on either students or faculty. It, it's, it, certainly, it certainly made me realize the degree of... Uh, of cooperation as that was expected. Universities have to make uncomfortable alliances with the nation and the state. How is this situation handled? How are the, how are the universities handled? At the University of New Hampshire in 2006, William Woodward, a professor of psychology, expressed his view in class that the Bush administration allowed the 9-11 attacks to occur. A number of students and local politicians insisted that he be fired and said there are limitations to academic freedom of speech. State legislators chimed in, demanding Woodward's dismissal and threatening to consider the issue when they next review the university's budget. Some universities, on the other hand, raised no issue. Of the hundreds of professors that began analyzing 9-11, Richard B. Lee, a distinguished professor at the University of Toronto, became the first academic in North America to teach a course that critically examined 9-11. I recall that the year was 2004, and I taught a first-year seminar on the subject of 9-11, critical perspectives on 9-11. Uh, the goal of the course was definitely to subject the official elements in the official story to the test of evidence. Elements that were in the official report or the official version uh, do not correspond to reality or uh, in some cases there were stories shown how the official narrative was shaped by excluding certain elements and including others. We built a course around uh, the first edition of David Ray Griffin's book, The New Pearl Harbor, which was questions, uh, questioning the official story of 9-11. Uh, he then has done an, a whole series of other volumes, each one with its meticulous, even-handed prose tone, which is really important. And students worked with that and then their own independent researches online and in newspaper archives that the students uh, pursued more specialized topics. In 2008, at McMaster University, Professor of Philosophy Mark Vorobej taught an upper-level undergraduate course in argumentation theory in which students had a strong background in philosophy and logical theory, but in his class 
students devoted five weeks to critically examine David Ray Griffin's scholarship on 9-11. Students deconstructed each chapter with insightful critiques and were impressed by Griffin's rigor and balanced research. Towards the end of the semester, one student polled the class. The result was unanimous. Professor Vorobej noted that students trained in logic and who studied the arguments of the New Pearl Harbor carefully recognized that the official 9-11 narrative cannot survive rational scrutiny, a result that was similar to the University of Toronto class. Many of Griffin's analyses focused on the contradictions, omissions, and distortions in the 9-11 Commission's report, which has brought attention to examining the 9-11 Commission itself. It, it, it certainly it's amazing that, 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 as you know, any investigation of any crime or any event uh, becomes less and less possible as time goes by. Four women who lost their husbands on 9-11, referred to as the Jersey Girls, motivated several 9-11 victim family members to compile well-researched questions regarding the failures and activities of government officials on the morning of 9-11 and called for an investigation. Despite the Bush administration's efforts to avoid any investigation for over a year, the Jersey Girls were successful in gaining media attention, which pressured the administration and led to the formation of the 9-11 Commission. One of the reasons to be suspicious of the 9-11 Commission report is because of the executive director. This is the man who is the head of, of the staff who did the actual work of producing the report. He's the man who decided what topics would be pursued, what topics were not, would not be pursued. He's the one who we are told, outlined the document, chapter titles, subheadings, before the investigation work of the commission even began. So in other words, he framed the narrative in advance, okay? And he obviously framed it to fit with the narrative that had already been created by the FBI. This is the executive director of the commission, Philip Zellico. Um, he was a close colleague of Condoleezza Rice, they had co-authored a book together. He had worked on national security with the first Bush presidency. He co-authored the um, uh, national security doctrine for the Bush junior presidency. Um, he was in every sense a Bush White House insider. And at the same time, he had control over which witnesses were called before the commission, what questions could be asked of them, uh, and he had control of the final edit of the 9-11 Commission report. So that by itself should never have been allowed. Uh, and in fact, the Jersey Girls did call for his resignation when they learned about his, his background, uh, but obviously nothing was done about it. We also know from Philip Sheenan's book, The Commission, that uh, Karl Rove was in fact the principal individual, Karl Rove, uh, Bush's senior aide, was pr the principal individual responsible for trying to um, avoid having any investigation at all. More, more incriminating is the fact that Zelico remained in contact with, um, with the Bush White House, with Karl Rove specifically, uh, while the commission was in, in uh, uh, progress and that that was explicitly uh, not, not allowed by its mandate. And he talked about, you know, how civil liberties would have to be greatly res restricted if this were to happen. Uh, foreign policy would have to be rewritten, which in the end he did. I mean, he helped write the new defense policy. Um, the president should be given extra powers in advance. He also published on the creation of public myth, or what he preferred to call public presumptions, stories, a special, special big stories that touch people in a nation and draw the nation together. It doesn't, they may be true, they may not be true, but they dominate people's consciousness. He'd written about this before 9-11. And then he goes on and authors, in effect, the 9-11 Commission report, which is about such a traumatizing event. It's just very, very strange. The entire mandate of the 9-11 Commission is, is paradoxical. 
Uh, I'll, I'll read it directly here from page 16 of the preface. Our aim has not been to assign individual blame. Our aim has been to provide the fullest possible account of the events surrounding 9-11 and to identify lessons learned. So how can you claim to um, conduct a comprehensive investigation of 9-11 if simultaneously it's not your goal to blame anyone? What if you actually came across evidence that, you know, <laughs> that proved someone was directly involved and, and, and what are you going to ignore that evidence? Uh, so it's, it begins from a paradoxical place. It also begins from uh, a set of, of, of historical parameters that are extremely narrow. Okay, so they decide purposefully, I think, purposely to to begin with the mid-1990s or so. That's where their story begins and they tell you about the history of Al-Qaeda. And, and, and that way they don't have to tell uh, stories about um, you know, the, the CIA's funding of the Mujahideen in Afghanistan uh, from which uh, Al-Qaeda is born, of course. There is a concerted effort to depict Al-Qaeda as what they call a substantial worldwide organization. So for example, the 9-11 Commission report describes Al-Qaeda in the following way. On page 67, they write, the inner core of Al-Qaeda continued to be a hierarchical, top-down group with defined positions, tasks, and salaries. Okay, so it sounds very much like your average corporation. However, as the former CIA executive director, uh, Buzzy Krongard, revealed to Salon.com in 2007, Al-Qaeda, in his opinion, is, quote, an amalgamation, a loose amalgamation of people who share an antipathy to the United States and all Western values. Some of them hate each other, some of them get along, some of them are very, very small splinter groups, but it's not like IBM with an organizational chart with black lines and chains of command and things like that. So there you have someone from the inside of the uh, national security state in the United States uh, so contradicting quite explicitly what the 9-11 Commission report tells us. Uh, others, uh, academics, have sort of reiterated this. Professor Andrew Silkey, for example, the director of terrorism studies at the University of East London, has said, and I, I'll quote directly again, to begin with, Al-Qaeda is not a traditional terrorist organization. It does not have a clear hierarchy, military mindset, and centralized command. At best, Al-Qaeda is a network of affiliated groups sharing religious and ideological backgrounds, but which often interact sparingly. So why, I guess we have to ask, would the 9-11 Commission go to such great lengths to portray Al-Qaeda as this worldwide organization in dozens of countries uh, with salaried positions when top intelligence experts and talk, top academics in the field of terrorism studies uh, tell us that, uh, in fact, the opposite is true. Part of how the legal system in, in the West works is that generally, this isn't true for all countries, but the basic system you say in England, the United States, and the United, uh, Canada, is an adversarial system. You know, you have the prosecutor, you have the defense, and they tell competing narratives. They, they give different explanations of what happened. The people who are accused, in other words, have a voice, they have an advocate. They are supposed to be presumed innocent. And of course, 9-11 Commission does not even attempt to replicate a legal procedure. And most importantly, just like the Warren Commission, as, as uh, Russell pointed out, there is no spokesperson for the accused. There's nobody who's appointed to represent Al-Qaeda or to tell their point of view or to explain where bin Laden was or what he was doing or any of that. <clears throat> so in effect, we get a monologue. You know, we hear only one voice throughout the whole document and it's all pushing one story. All anomalies, all difficulties can be put to one side. The whole point of, of the, the, um, the idea of competing parties 
an adversarial system, is that hopefully in that debate and the rough and tumble, the truth will emerge. How is the truth going to emerge in a monologue? A monologue told by people who were very close to the U.S. government, people like the executive director, Philip Zelikow. I think, I think one thing, one way in which the media contribute to um, this uh, notion of al-Qaeda as this worldwide organization that threatens, to, threatens the you know, uh, American way of life is by using um, al-Qaeda in connection with just about every terrorist incident that, that happens anywhere. Uh, so when, when journalists use phrases such as inspired by al-Qaeda, you know, this attack was uh, either inspired by or the group that, that uh, uh, committed the attack was linked to al-Qaeda. Uh, what exactly does that mean? It's, it's not clear. Is this some kind of ideological uh, affinity that they have? Uh, if, as Buzzy Krongard says, you only have to have an antipathy towards the United States to, to be considered part of al-Qaeda, well, then you know, half the planet could, could fit that description. Uh, an example in the 9-11 Commission report of the uh, exaggeration of al-Qaeda's capacity, uh, there are many such examples, but one example I'll point to is on page 180, in which the Commission writes, the terrorist plots that were broken up at the end of 1999 display the variety of operations that might be attributed, however indirectly, to al-Qaeda. And I think, you know, that's an indicative phrase, however indirectly. It basically says, you know, we're beyond the sort of, uh, uh, you know, trying to connect Kevin Bacon to other actors here. We're basically saying uh, this Al-Qaeda is this amorphous thing that we can, uh, we can apply in almost any circumstance. Um, so I think we need, we need a better definition of it. Um, a, a otherwise, it, it only contributes to the expansion of this uh, so-called war on terror. Um, I think the most common reason given by average people of you know, why they believe Al-Qaeda is behind 9-11 uh, is the, the confession video that was released in December 2001. The, you know, in relation to that, there was the admission, um, the Washington Post published a story in which the, they revealed that the CIA had actually prepared a fake tape of Osama bin Laden and his alleged followers and the idea of the tape was to portray bin Laden as a pedophile. Um, and they had done a similar project. They were actually working on a similar project uh, to, to spread a tape about Saddam Hussein and to try to discredit him in the Arab world. Um, so we actually have admission from the CIA that they have created a fake tape of Osama bin Laden. Now, that doesn't prove that the confession video is, you know, of the same kind of, of fakery, but um, certainly it, it, it shows some kind of intent was there. So we're reading the 9-11 Commission report, and we find a footnote. There's a forest of footnotes. This is why it looks like scholarship. It's big and heavy. It's got little print. It's got a lot of footnotes, and they're in even smaller print. So it's got it's made to look like an academic work. So you say, well, that's interesting. One study revealed that 25% of the footnotes in the 9-11 Commission report are based on tortured testimony. Um, it's even more condensed when you consider that most of that tortured testimony belongs to chapters 5 and 7 of the report, which deal with the alleged uh, Al-Qaeda Al -Qaeda plot. On on page 146 of the 9-11 Commission report, the commissioners admit that they were not allowed to meet with the alleged al-Qaeda detainees. They were not allowed to submit questions to the detainees. They were not even allowed to submit questions to the alleged interrogators. 
uh, they were told that it would interrupt the interrogation process, a process which we now know had consisted of uh, uh, 183 waterboardings in one month. They even admit, they give one little part of the page in which they say, well, you know, a lot of what we've based on here is from people held in detention. We can't be sure that this is accurate. Uh, we weren't allowed to interview them or talk to these detainees. We weren't even allowed to talk to the people who interrogated them. Um, so it's kind of secondhand, but we decided, you know, to go ahead. They didn't just go ahead. They made it the core of their story. And they don't discuss there the fact that these guys were tortured. In the ca case of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, something like 190 times he was waterboarded, or that, that he was told his son might be killed, uh, you know, and all these kinds of things. He later, later told the ICRC, the Red Cross, that he'd made stuff up. Well, of course you'd make stuff up. They don't discuss that. They don't discuss the moral implications, the epistemological implications. What does it mean to, to base a story on that kind of testimony? It's absurd. The National Institute of Standards and Technology, also known as NIST, funded by the U.S. Department of Commerce, was mandated by Congress to explain the collapse of the World Trade Center Tower buildings and World Trade Center Building 7. It was a 47-story steel frame building consisting of New York City's Emergency Command Center and the second largest CIA office. Building 7 was not hit by a plane, and NIST concluded that office fires initiated by the debris from the falling towers would be the first time in history fires brought down a steel-framed high-rise building. When you look at the Beijing Hotel fire, the Mandarin Hotel was full of fireworks for distribution worldwide caught on fire and we ended up with an inferno of that building and it stood it, it didn't collapse. So the question is why did the Beijing fire uh, not result in a global collapse of that structure whereas in the case of seven it did. Based entirely on a computer model Nis concluded that the fires caused a particular beam to thermally expand, taking the girder of a column off its seat, leaving it unsupported, which caused it to buckle. Those academics whose work relate to 9-11 matters, I think they have a role to play, especially, especially engineers. Because the 9-11 the story that the government has advocated is based on engineering flaws. If this is a crime, I think everybody agrees it's a crime, evidence was removed from the scene of the crime. Well, if evidence is removed, no scientist can possibly reconstruct what happened. A scientist has no better friend than valid critics to whom they respond. Um, and if the criticisms uh, lead to abandonment of the hypothesis because it doesn't fit, the, because the facts don't fit the idea, then the hypothesis must be abandoned and replaced with something more adequate. Upon being corrected by a high school physics teacher, NIST admitted in their final report that Building 7 came down in free fall acceleration for over a hundred feet, encountering zero resistance in that period of time. And in the 10-story analysis structure that uh, I and two co-authors have put together, we clearly show that there is sawtooth action when you remove all of the columns in any story above the bottom one. Uh, you're going to get the conservational momentum principle applies, and it's going to slow down the velocity and that seemingly uh, doesn't appear to be the case uh, from what we've witnessed. So why are we having a conflict between Newtonian physics and observation? And I think that's an open question that more people ought to be probing into. Despite its mandate to provide the fullest account of 9-11, the 571-page commission report did not mention Building 7, except in a little footnote. 
Across the entire spectrum of the events of 9-11, evidence has been in the process of being destroyed or withheld. Many of the tapes which had testimony from torture which were crucial to the 9-11 story were destroyed by the CIA. Despite an agreement between the Security and Exchange Commission to keep all of its records, the data regarding put options in the days leading up to 9-11 have been destroyed. In response to a civil engineer trying to verify NIST's work, they stated that all files of Building 7's Global Collapse computer model have been classified because it is a national security issue. It's regarded as so, so, so explosive in that issue uh, that the, the, the proofs, the so-called proofs for it were, were so badly presented by the administration back several years ago uh, that a great many questions have arisen and none of them have been answered. And, and yet here we are still engaged in, in two wars uh, which, which flow straight right from 9-11 and what happened on that day. I thought it was very important to communicate to the public uh, what they may not know, and certainly nobody was talking about it, that under international law this was a supreme crime, uh, which is a war of aggression, uh, invasion of another country. That is the supreme law uh, of international law, the supreme crime under which all the other crimes follow. I mean, that's already established international law. So I just put that out to normal places that normally uh, had published my uh, correspondence and just said, are people aware of that? No one would publish that. And all I did was quote the international law word for word. Nobody. Well, in, during that period, somebody uh, got in touch with me and said, we want to have you debate uh, somebody from the U.S. on this. McMurtry was asked to debate Thomas Donnelly, who had been an executive of the think tank Project for a New American Century, which consisted of neoconservatives such as Rumsfeld, Cheney, and Wolfowitz. A year before 9-11, Donnelly was the principal author of the think tank's defining document, Rebuilding America's Defenses, which called for defense spending to be raised to a hundred billion dollars and advocated full-spectrum dominance to deny others the use of outer space and to preemptively take actions. But for all this to happen, it would take far too long unless there was a catastrophic and catalyzing event, like a new Pearl Harbor. In Washington, we're joined by Thomas Donnelly, an expert on U.S. foreign policy and defense. He's with the American Enterprise Institute. Donnelly says the U.S. has a great responsibility to protect freedom around the world, and he disagrees with those who say Bush is the bigger threat. And with us here in studio is John McMurtry. He's an author and philosophy professor at the University of Guelph. He says Bush's policies are the biggest threat to world peace, and that they, in fact, they constitute a war crime. You now, you have written about the U.S. threat to peace. Do you believe that the United States is more of a threat to peace than, than Saddam Hussein? Absolutely. Why? Well, uh, the biggest threat uh, to me is, well, Saddam Hussein, you must remember, was uh, very much supported by the U.S. in the, uh, in the 80s, and indeed his coup d'etat was uh, favored by the U.S., and his worst crimes were done with U.S. support, and many of his arms were imported from Britain in the U.S. But the concern I have is not to wind it back to who's responsible for Saddam Hussein, but rather what is happening to the Iraqi people. And uh, we have, with the U.S. proceeding to go unilaterally uh, in, in uh, the, announcing its intention to, uh, to wage war, it is already in violation of the Nuremberg Charter. A war crime begins with the planning, preparation, initiation, or waging of a war in violation of international treaties, agreements, or insurance. Uh, in fact, there's impeachment proceedings, articles being drawn up in the United States for also violating the U.S. War Crimes Act, and we also have such a War Crimes Act here. Uh, he, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Thomas, uh, is advocating war crime here. Uh, I suppose he would be, uh, in this sense, uh, subject to the uh, application of the law there as well. War crimes now, because they're invading another country? Yes, without, without validation by the Security Council of the United Nations and in violation of international law. 
uh, and then the war crime is already in place when you start to move outside and they have announced very clearly their intention to move with or without the UN and that is a war crime to proceed to do to uh, to, to wage to prepare and uh, plan for war and Mr. Donnelly's uh, recent article he said planning for war he is he himself is advocating a war crime are you advocating <laughs> war crime Mr. Donnelly uh, look, that past statement was so morally, politically, legally perverse that, that I have to argument, raise please. objection to it. Um, look, uh, let's begin with the legal uh, argument. Uh, surely UN Resolution 1441 already provides the basis for taking military action against Iraq. You are advocating the planning and preparation for war against Iraq without in any international legitimation by the Security Council. So you are now no, advocating a war crime. Well, um, obviously we're not that having much not of a debate. dialogue here. Well, I, I, I don't know what uh, serious consequences uh, was uh, understood by the diplomatic community to mean other than <clears throat> Uh, that there would be military action taken to enforce resolution 1441 and also to enforce the previous 16 resolutions. This is a complete non sequitur. It does not follow from 1441. This has been declared by uh, every, well, including the Secretary General. Uh, it is, you see, there's a presupposition here that God is America and, God, and America makes these judgments or its president makes these judgments independent of international law. And that you have, uh, you know, it's not just international law, the war crimes, court, the International Criminal Court, you refuse to sign on for it, you refuse to sign on for the legislation against crimes against humanity and war crimes. You refuse to sign on and indeed have sabotage conventions on uh, chemical and biological weapons, on the ABM treaty, on Kyoto Protocol, okay, so let's sign, not and on and on you go. You are a rogue administration. Okay, you this is are the, the biggest danger. Okay, so that, I'm going to give Thomas Donnelly a, a final uh, word on that. So that, that, that's Mr. McMurtry's case. Which, give us a final word. Also, well, look, I, I, I would like to conclude by saying that uh, the use of American power in the world has been, as a matter of uh, practical and historical fact, um, the sole uh, um, uh, reliable uh, um, instrument, first of all, for bringing peace and stability and freedom to the European continent. Oh, Secondly, um, uh, we hope we, now yeah, really, to, to right. do the same sort of thing uh, in Iraq. And the person who invited me to do it is bureaucratically removed. Well, the unspeakable is again something I've written about academically in a logic journal. You know, a, a ruling structure of fallacy, I call it. What it is, is you never discuss anything that is uh, in conflict with the basic ruling structure of society. So, for example, um, you, don't, you don't talk in the United States, you wouldn't talk about, uh, say, the, cr the international crime, war crime of the U.S., because that would be going against the basic ruling structure of that society. So it was unspeakable. And you don't even now hear those words being used. In 1991, Wolfowitz told General Wesley Clark that they had to attack the Middle East between the years of approximately 1996 to 2001, before the next superpower challenges the United States. In the weeks right after 9-11, General Clark was shocked to learn that those plans were now in effect. I went downstairs. I was leaving the Pentagon, and an officer from the Joint Staff called me into his office. He said, um, he pulled up a piece of paper off his desk. He said, I just got this memo from the Secretary of Defense's office that says we're going to attack and destroy the governments in, in seven countries in five years. We're going to start with Iraq, and then we're going to move to Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and Iran. I said, seven, seven countries in five years. I said, is that a classified memo? He said, yes, sir. I said, well, don't show it to me. He was about to show it to me. He said, because I want to talk about it. And I, I, I sat on this information I, for a long time, for about six or eight months. I, I was so stunned by this, I couldn't begin to talk about it. And I couldn't believe it would really be true, but that's actually what happened. 
and yet the universities are sleeping so soundly you can hear that you could hear the snoring from outer space you see my point think of the thousands of people that are involved here think about the university's self-image this is a place where intelligence flourishes this is like a temple to the mind huge research libraries thousands of professors you know uh, working away um, gathering knowledge information critical analysis postmodern this and that but really proud of their critical faculties hundreds of thousands of students working away smart smart young people how on earth could a group of people and these are people for whom universities generally have contempt people associated with the Bush administration widely derided made fun of by academics how would they fool the universities? See, I think this is so interesting and important that it's worth thinking about in its own right. Now, of course, we know there are dissidents within universities, and the number is growing. But when you think about the potential power of universities, it's not, not a formal political power, an informal power that comes through credibility, high status in, in society, and influence. They could be stopping this whole thing in its tracks but they're not. The real facts behind 9-11 are the linchpin of the 21st century because the entire narrative has been built on the premise that the, there are implacable enemies of the United States and of the West who will stop at nothing to uh, do you know, heinous crimes and so that will justify erosion of civil liberties. That will justify unlimited uh, allocation for defense spending. And that will limit uh, securities, uh, pat-downs in airports of 80-year-old grandmothers are getting patted down in the airports. It's all justified in terms of this pivotal event. And of course, there's a lot of uh, security billions invested in maintaining that that story and so I think that the task of universities and university professors has to be relentlessly questioning that story and any other story that doesn't stand the smell test and that seems to support uh, who benefits from these things it's not the people of Iraq or the people of Afghanistan who are being pounded to bits, it's, but it certainly is the large uh, defense establishment, the military forces that are benefiting because they have a new enemy. And so that, I think, is an absolutely crucial uh, task that academics should undertake. So that's what our aim is, to ensure that the public is aware that this kind of investigation is needed and we're prepared to do our part in this regard.